Well, in the context that that verse was written, uh, the church was just a tiny, tiny group. And in just a few years, it blew up and grew into this group that we began to read about. And over the next 100, 200 years, literally took over the world and changed everything. So what I want to look at this morning as we continue going through our purpose statement, we exist to glorify God by gathering people, growing together, and giving ourselves away, is how did they do that? How did that little nondescript group manage to grow into such a vibrant faith community? Uh, they didn't have any evangelism classes to go to. Uh, they didn't have the internet to consult. Uh, they didn't have Bibles for the most part. Uh, they didn't have any of the resources we have, and yet they grew from virtually nothing to this extremely large, vibrant group that were practicing their faith together. We did that because God used them to grow his church. Remember Jesus said, I will build my church. And he's the one that's building it, but we are the instruments he uses to work through. And uh, it's, it's interesting to me, I have thought for years, I, I always like it when I get something in my, my mail that sort of verifies some of the things I've thought. Uh, but I've thought for years that we approach the Bible oftentimes in the wrong way and, and we present everything in a, in a really rosy light. And we forget that the people God used in the Bible were just folks like you and me. Uh, they weren't seven feet tall. Uh, they didn't have extreme intellect. Uh, they were just average, everyday people, all fraught with faults and failures, and yet God used them. Now, one of the things I was reading this week sort of put it this way. They said, God didn't love Abraham and David and Isaac and all those heroes of the faith because they were good. They were good because God loved them. And if you see them, if you read about them, before God put his hand upon them, they were for the most part not what we would call good. They all had their problems, as you all have your problems. Now, the reason we want to talk about that is because a lot of you think, well, I can't do anything. Nobody wants to listen to me. I'm just Joe or Nancy Average. And that's a good thing. Because God uses Joe and Nancy average to do above average things. So those are the people God uses. You are the people God will use. Now granted, Jesus was what we might call a master team builder. That's kind of a big thing in, in the last few years in the corporate world. You know, we build teams and all these things. And if anybody was ever good at it, it was Jesus himself. Is what, he took this a small band of 12 people and he tells them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But before they, he sent them out, he spent a little time bringing them together and teaching them. Now, the thing I want you to know about the, the apostles is uh, they were, for the most part, a very unremarkable group. And if you've read the Gospels, you see that Jesus drew, drew them from different fields, some professional, some blue-collar, uh, and there wasn't any one thing about them that uh, marked them as special. They were unremarkable, but they were a dedicated group. And because they were dedicated to Christ's message and his program, they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. Now, I want to share with you something that uh, I've shared before. Some of you have heard it, but this is really good. Uh, a lot of times today in the corporate world, we have consulting groups. If we're going to uh, hire somebody, especially management personnel or somebody that we think has management abilities, and we'll have these uh, uh, consultants uh, look at them and give us a report on them. Now, here's what might have happened had Jesus done that. Let's say that Jesus consulted this group, and uh, we're going to call them the Jordan Management Consultants, and they're located in Jerusalem. 
So here's their response to Jesus' inquiry about these fellows he's about to call for his apostles. They say, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you're considering for management positions in your new organization. All of them have taken our battery of tests, the results of which uh, we've run through our sophisticated computer analysis. We've also arranged personal interviews for each candidate with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. It is our staff's unanimous opinion that most of the nominees are lacking in qualifications for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. We recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. We find that Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. He seems far too impulsive to be put in a position of oversight. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The brothers James and John place personal interest above company loyalty, and they seem to be impatient with others. Due to this impatience and ambition, they could one day become disgruntled employees. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that could tend to undermine morale. We feel it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> In closing, one of the candidates shows great potential. He is a man of ability, resourcefulness, and ambition. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your comptroller and right-hand man. All the other profiles are self-explanatory. Sincerely yours, Jordan Management Consultants, Jerusalem. You see, Jesus takes the people that nobody else thinks he should and uses them to further his kingdom. He mobilized the people he had into a force that was dedicated and passionate about his program. So what would happen if all of us had the same dedication and passion for his program today, for his program at Parkside Church. What would happen if all of us spent 10% of our time promoting Parkside Church and Jesus Christ? Just think what, what that might, might look like. We, uh, we believe in and we teach tithing here. And we, we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, well, when we talk about tithing, it's usually in the context of financial and money. But what if we talked about it in our time? What if we spent 10% of our time sharing Jesus Christ or Parkside Church? What is it that attracts people to a church? The number one thing that attracts people to church is the people that are already there and their contact with them. It's people inviting other people. All the studies that have been done and there have been a plethora of them always show that the number one reason people visit a church is because somebody personally invited them to come. Number one. The number one reason they come back will be they either liked the pastor in the message or they liked the worship leader in the worship. But the number one reason they come is because someone personally invited them. Now, liking the pastor and the worship leader only goes so far, though. Because they'll only stay a short time if that's as far as it goes. They have to then make a connection with the people that are here, and that is why they will stay long term. So church growth begins with the people and ends successfully with the people. You have the pastor and the worship leader in there, and they better be doing a, a good job. But that's not the reason they come, and that's not the reason they stay long term. The reason they come and the reason they stay is because of people. Enthusiastic, real people. Now, I had an interesting experience, and I think it was Thursday. I've been working on this project. It's the dog kennel, the end all dog kennels. 
And I've been working on this thing and, and Bob has helped me and some others have helped me for, I don't know, a month or two months or whatever it's been. And it involves hauling in large amounts of fill and I'm doing it a pickup load at a time and I'm shoveling it in a wheelbarrow. So Thursday, I'm shoveling fill into the wheelbarrow and here these two young guys show up and they look like they're late teens, early 20s and they've got white shirts and ties and uh, uh, elder so-and-so on their, on their button, you know. And uh, since my new neighbor across the street's a Mormon and they visit him all the time, they've seen me and they probably know what I do. So anyway, uh, they come up to me and they, what are you building? Dog kennel? Oh, wow, it's quite a dog kennel. Yeah, quite a dog kennel. Uh, you doing it all by yourself? I said, yeah, for now. Well, can we help? Yeah, they have white shirts and ties. And I said, well, yeah, sure, I've got shovels over there. You serious? Yeah, yeah, I wish we will help. And I said, no, I'm just kidding you. I don't want you guys. Well, if we come back and, and go change our clothes and come back, can we help? And uh, I said, no, that's fine, I'll, I'll do it. But they were serious. Now they didn't say anything about the Mormon church, they didn't say anything about their theology or anything. They just offered to help me. So as they left, here was my thought. If I didn't know about their theology, and therefore can't be a part of their group, I would go take a look at their group. You see? Because they genuinely were going to help me do something. See? So it's people connecting with people that makes the difference. As Christians, this should not be an option for us. We should consider ourselves slaves to Jesus Christ. And slaves don't have a voice, do they, in what they do. They just have to do it. So I want to take you to another portion of Scripture now. And this is the Apostle Paul and how he views himself. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'll, I'll just read it here for you. He says, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ because of my preaching to you Gentiles. As you already know, God has given me this special ministry of announcing his favor to you. As I briefly mentioned earlier in this letter, God himself revealed his secret plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand what I know about this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now he has revealed it by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is the secret plan, that the Gentiles have an equal share with the Jews in all the riches inherited by God's children. Both groups have believed the good news, and both are part of the same body and enjoy together the promise and the blessing of Jesus Christ. By God God's special favor and mighty power, I have been given the wonderful privilege of serving him by spreading the good news. Just think, though I did nothing to deserve it, and though I am the least deserving Christian there is, I was chosen for this special joy of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. And I was chosen to explain to everyone this plan that God, the creator of all things, has kept secret from the beginning. Now, Paul's in prison for preaching the gospel. And yet, when he describes himself, he talks about what a wonderful privilege it is for him to be there. Because God selected him to share this message. And we often look at sharing the message as uh, a burden or something we don't want to do when we should think about it as it's our great privilege to be able to share that because God called us into his kingdom and gave us that message. So I just want to look at this passage a little bit. The first thing we see with Paul is he considers himself a prisoner. Now when he writes this, he is a prisoner of the Romans, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about being a prisoner of Jesus Christ, a prisoner to the gospel, a slave if you will. He cannot do anything but what Christ wants him to do. And we are the same. We are all prisoners, in a sense, of Jesus Christ. We can't break out. There's no way we can get out of the salvation that we have. We are captive to it. It's kind of like uh, one of my favorite uh, songs. Some of you will remember it. Uh, from the, the Eagles did it. 
Welcome to the Hotel California. You know, you can check out, but you can never leave. And that's the way it is in Christianity. Once Jesus Christ becomes your Lord and Savior, you can't get away. You can check out. You can say, well, I'm disgruntled with this. I'm disillusioned with this. I don't want to follow Jesus. I'm just going to sit home and do nothing. You can check out, but you can't leave. He's still going to take you to heaven when you die. He's still going to love you. But since you're there, you might as well enjoy the place. And you won't enjoy it if you're checked out. And too many Christians have checked out. They miss the joy and excitement of being prisoners of Jesus Christ. And isn't that weird that Paul talks about uh, joy in the context of being a prisoner? How does that work? You see? He talks about excitement in the context of being a prisoner. How does that work? Let's listen to Paul here again in verse uh, 2. He says, As you already know, God has given me this special ministry of announcing favor to you Gentiles. See, it's our special privilege to be able to tell people about the salvation Jesus Christ offers. In verse 7, he calls it God's special favor. In verse 8, he talks about special joy. And that's the way it ought to be. Uh, I've, I've told you before about the time uh, Jim... Kendall and I were down at uh, Mission Viejo and we were uh, uh, going to some seminar there at Saddleback Church. And you know, Saddleback was one of those churches that kind of grew from nothing uh, into a mega church in a very short period of time. And you want to know why? Well, you could say, well, yeah, Rick Warren is an exceptional guy and that would be a, a proper statement. But that's not why. There are a lot of exceptional guys in the ministry that never grow a megachurch. Now, we, we went to the seminar, and, and, uh, but we, we really found out why Saddleback is so successful when we went to a little taco stand. And as we go in there, it was one of those places where you get your shell and you go down and do your thing, you know. And uh, we, were, we asked the guy behind the counter uh, something about how do you get from here to to wherever it was we wanted to go and it wasn't we weren't going to Saddleback right at that time we were going to go see something else and he immediately picks up that we're from out of town oh you're from out of town yeah yeah we're from Camas Washington oh you're gonna be here Sunday yeah we're gonna be here you gotta go to Saddleback Church I go there it's great blah 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 blah. you gotta come here's how you get there and I can meet you there the reason Saddleback Church grew into a mega church is because of the guy in the taco stand and several other people just like him. They were all enthused and excited about what was going on at Saddleback Church. And they didn't miss an opportunity to tell anybody they met. What would happen at Parkside Church if we were like that? Don't know, but it'd be fun to see. We've got the festival in the park coming up next week. How about inviting people to come to that? Hey, come to church this Sunday and afterwards we'll go do that. See, one of the reasons you don't is because you don't think anybody really wants to hear about it. See? And so, we not, none of us like rejection, so we don't say anything. So, I'm going to ask Donna to come up here and share with you an experience she had this last week. So Don, here. And this is really good. I didn't know anything about this until this morning when we met together at a regular, regular time and she was telling me the story and I said, wow, that's exactly what I want to get across in the message this morning. Uh, will you tell that to the folks? And obviously she said yes. <laughs> well, and it was very unexpected actually. Um, Jay and I with um, our friends Charles and Katie um, that came and sang here with Press Corps. Well, um, Charles had contacted me earlier in the week and he goes, Donna, can you and Jade come out? We really want to go pass these flyers out in Camas to make sure that you all have a really good turnout at Music in the Park. And I, and I said, well, actually, it was kind of interesting too, is that um, we had originally planned on on that, that evening. We didn't think we were going to be able to do it, but as God would have it, that couple was not able to come over 
So I contacted Charles and said, yeah, Jay and I can be there. So we met at 6.30 at the DQ, and we had our little package of flyers with us for music in the park, and Charles was all enthusiastic, and he goes, here's the motto, everyone gets one. And we were thinking of talking about the flyers. Well, so we're walking up and down the blocks of downtown Camas, and some very interesting things happen. The first thing that I discovered is just how receptive this community is to community events that are going on in it. We have a community here in Camas that is very eager to both support and participate in community events. And so whenever we would go and we'd say, hey, our church is having a free community concert in the park on Sunday. Can we give you this flyer and would you please come? And they're like, yeah, this is great. They were very enthusiastic. All the businesses were extremely enthusiastic and supportive of us putting the flyers in their establishment and helping to support the event that we are having at, at, at uh, the park next Sunday. Well, so um, Katie and I walk into the Camus Hotel and we hand them a flyer and then we come out and I see that Jade is talking to two women at the little water fountain. There, in the, if you're familiar with the downtown portion of Camus, there's that little water fountain right next door to the hotel. There's these two women and they're sitting there and Jade's talking with them. So I walk up, and um, what we discover is that they are from Southern California, and they are wanting to move to Washington um, because of the recent legislation change in supporting gay marriage. This is a gay couple that we were talking to. And the gal that was doing most of the talking, she had kind of this um, head scarf on her head. And uh, she was very, very distraught because while she was here in Camus, um, her and her partner, she felt were very rejected and had been judged and treated very unkindly while they were here. And they were extremely discouraged. And then, as the conversation progressed, the gal with the scarf on her head says, and I'm going through chemotherapy right now. And at that point, my heart just broke. And we could both see how sad, how discouraged, and how sad they were trying to find a place to live, feeling very rejected, very unaccepted, and of course, it's not that we embrace the lifestyle they are choosing, but just as Paul said, so were some of you, right? Before we come into Christ, we all have a history. We all have a past. And Jade goes, well, we don't judge you. And I replied to her, I am so very sorry that you were treated so unkind while you were here. And then I asked, would it be all right if we prayed for you? And her eyes lit up, and she says, yes, yes, please, would you please pray for us? And so we sat with them there at the water fountain, and we prayed a very simple prayer that God would just pour out his love over them, and that Jesus would express just how much he desires to have them in his life. And we ended it with that. And um, by the time we were done praying for her, she was very teary and crying, and her partner was very teary and crying, and they were, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And they were sad, actually, that they were gonna still be in town so that they could come to the music in the park event. But what I find completely miraculous about this whole event is if we weren't out there, if we weren't just passing these flowers up, flyers out and, and engaging in our community, how many open doors would have been never opened? <laughs> would we have never walked through? That couple would have left Camus feeling completely dejected and maybe even that much harder to any message of Jesus Christ in the future. So that was our experience.
Thanks, Donna. So you see, people are more receptive than you think. And I find that same thing at, at the gym all the time. People, people will know that I'm a pastor, and just out of the blue, they'll want me to pray for them. Or if some loved one of theirs is sick or that, they'll ask me to pray for them. And, and it's, a, it's a great thing. So people are, are a little more interested, really, than what you might think. But now you, you may be thinking, well, who, me? You know, that's one thing for Donna to do that. And it's another thing for you to do that. But me? Well, Paul is pretty much representative of all of us, isn't he? You, if you know his background, he was not a nice guy. Uh, so he had his problems, just like you and I all had our problems. Maybe not to the extent Paul did, uh, but we had our problems. And God touched us, and God touched him, and uses us anyway. Uh, you know, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says that Paul is Christ's ambassador or representative, right? Know what it says? No, it's not what it says. <laughs> it says, you are my ambassadors or my representatives. You and I and Paul, all of us, are representatives of Jesus Christ. So we should be about representing him well. You can reach people no one else can reach. You as an individual. Did you know that? There are people that you could lead to Christ or that you could invite successfully to come to Parkside Church that would never come if I invited them. You say, well, why is that? Well, because you are you and I am me. I think I got the English right. You see? And we're all unique. We all have different skills and different uh, things in our lives that, uh, that allow others to relate to us. Um, to steal something from Saddleback, they have this thing called SHAPE. That's an acronym, you know, S-H-A-P-E, and we'll talk about that. But each of you have your own unique shape. And that allows you to speak to people effectively that I or someone else would not be able to. Remember this. Only you can be you. Okay. Only you can be you. And God began molding you into what you are, into who you are today, uh, as soon as you uh, showed up in your mother's womb. Remember scripture tells us that uh, in Psalm 139. Verses 13 through 16, it says this. He's speaking to God. He says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, and how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now some of you need to mark that in your Bible and go back and read it from time to time. Because he's talking about you. And he's saying that God's workmanship in you is marvelous. He's saying that God made you just the way he wants you. You know, too often we look in the mirror and we slap God in the face. You know, we say, well, is that the best you could do? You know? Well, yeah, that is the best he could do. He did exactly what he wanted. He wants you to be you. Okay? So when, when we look at ourselves and say, well, I can't do anything because this, that, or the other way, we're, we're really saying, we're, we're criticizing God. And that's probably not the best thing to do. So let's look at this shape thing. What is that all about? Well, the first one is, is S. And S is your spiritual gifts. Now, the Bible's plain, isn't it? We all have at least one spiritual gift, 1 Corinthians 12. And some of us have more than one. So you may have multiple spiritual gifts, but you will always have at least one. So God has gifted you to do something. You say, well, how do I know what my spiritual gift is? Well, you can pray about it. 
you can read scripture and that's all helpful but the best way to find out what your spiritual gift is is through experimentation start doing something start doing some things and see what it is uh, that turns you on so to speak see what it is uh, that comes naturally to you that you seem to have an ability to do that's part of your particular shape the second one is your heart and the heart's kind of, we use heart as uh, the seat of the emotions. Now another word might be passion. What is it that you're passionate about? What is it that you get excited about? You know, in, in 1 Samuel 12, 20, it says, Serve the Lord with all your heart. You know, and Jesus said, you know, the most important thing, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Whatever you eat or you drink, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I know that's another word of saying, do it with all your heart. Get in there and get after it. God, you see, has shaped your heart. And there's something that you are passionate about. The A is abilities. These are the natural talents that you were born with. Uh, Exodus 31, 1 through 5 is a good example of how God gives people skills. You know, sometimes when we think of God giving us gifts, we think of only what we call spiritual things. But anything you have is a gift from God. Do you realize that? If you are a good carpenter, that's a gift that God has given you. If you're a, a, a good manager, that's a gift God has given you. And in Exodus chapter 31, uh, God has been giving instructions to Moses on how to build the temple. And here's what he says. He says, The Lord also said to Moses, Look, I have chosen Beelzeel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Now here are some of those things he has given him. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him wisdom, intelligence, skill in all kinds of crafts. He is able to create beautiful objects from gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in cutting and setting gemstones and in carving wood. Yes, he is a master at every craft. You see, oftentimes we don't think about those things as spiritual gifts. But if you have a talent for painting, that's a gift given to us by God, or given to you by God. He certainly didn't give that one to me. But anyway, they all come from God. Do you know that God even gives you the ability to make money? If you have it. Uh, some of us missed out on that one. But some people just seem to have a knack for it, don't they? They, they just seem to be good at investing and are good at whatever they, they do and they make money. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it says, You shall remember the Lord God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. So whatever it is you're good at, God has gifted you with the ability to be good at that thing. So, you will be able to relate to others that have those kinds of abilities. And P is your personality. You ever notice how God loves variety in people? He made us all so different. You know, and we have the whole spectrum of personalities. We have the introverts on one end and the extroverts on the other end and people in the middle and all of those sorts of things. There are thinkers and there are feelers, you know. And... Uh, which one's the most important? Are the extroverts the most important? I mean, they're the ones that are always out there, kind of in your face, blah, you know, car salesmen, all those kind of guys, insurance salesmen, pastors, some of them. Or are, the, or are the introverts the most important? Because they're always thinking things through and examining things and, and that sort of thing. There is no right or wrong. In personality. There is no better or best between extroverts and introverts. They're all important. God created them all, you see. And whichever one you are, or if you're somewhere in the middle, that's good, because that's the way God created you. So you use that gift. We need all kinds of personalities to balance the church and give it flavor. It would be sad if we were all extroverts. It'd be a nut house. <laughs> and if we were all introverts, it'd be a very boring place. So we need a balance. We need them both.
and everybody in between. Remember, only you can be you. And finally, the EE experiences. You have all had different experiences. And God will use those experiences to allow you to relate to others. In Romans 8, 28, you know, we're told that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So you may have had bad experiences along the way, but God will use those bad experiences in order for you to minister to other people. I know I can talk to some people and they will listen because of some of the experiences I can bring to play. Now, they will say something, you know, and uh, I'll say, yeah, I know, I was that way when I was that age too. And it opens up a big conversation and we're able to talk to one another. So your experiences will all come into play. Your shape because your unique shape was sovereignly determined by God for His purpose, embrace it. Don't look at it as a negative. Because it's not. It's a positive. Because God designed you. Let me just paraphrase this passage here in Ephesians 3. It's simply, I think, can be reduced to this. God has sovereignly shaped us into who we are so that we can be fully engaged in the ministry he has called us to for the benefit of others. See? We're all called into the ministry for the benefit of others. So here's my question for you. Are you fully engaged? Are you excited about what goes on at Parkside Church? Are you excited about what's going to go on next Sunday? Are you inviting people? Are you sharing with people? I don't know. But if not, I would encourage you to engage. Don't be checked out. Get in, get excited, get about God's business. Begin to grow in God's service. Because if we aren't growing, we're stagnating. Remember, there's no status quo. You're either moving ahead or you're falling behind. Why don't we experiment over the next few weeks and just see how many people you can invite? You never know. You might be surprised at how many show up. I can't remember right now, I don't recall it exactly, but the, the salesmen, when they're cold calling, they have some, some rule, I forget what it is, but it's, I'll probably get the numbers wrong, but it's like if they make 100 contacts, they'll get 10 responses, and out of the 10 responses, they'll get one sale. So, folks, the key is, make the 100 contacts. And you'll get some kind of response. So let's be about God's business. Be excited about what we're doing. Be telling other people. Be inviting other people. And I, I, I'll share something with you in closing that I'm really excited about. Uh, one thing that we have done, we've decided to uh, expand our missions outreach and reach all the way from Parkside Church all the way to into uh, two very exotic places known as Camas and Washougal. And uh, to, to do that, uh, if you look around, you'll see that there's a demographic that we don't have. And that demographic is, uh, we don't have any teenagers, any youth in our church. And uh, what, we, what we've decided to do is we decided to take some money out of the missions budget. We're going to uh, call Dan uh, as a youth, youth pastor, part-time. And we're going to stretch a little bit to pay him, so you can be praying about that, too, that God will provide the finances. And we needed to do that because we needed to free him up, getting some time to do this thing. So uh, we're going to officially uh, commission uh, him and Skyler uh, in September. I'm back to church Sunday the 15th. Uh, so that's an exciting thing. It's a big stretch for us, uh, but what we're doing is we're just going to invest some money right here in Camas and Washougal uh, instead of sending it all around the world. Now, we do that too, and that's all good, but it's, it's really exciting, going to be exciting to see what God does uh, with Dan and Skyler and uh, this outreach program. So be in prayer about that. Pray for them. 
uh, and pray for uh, the people that they will be talking to and uh, just pray for the church that we'll continue to have resources to be able to cover the cost of this thing and who knows what God might do you know if you don't if you don't step out of your comfort zone once in a while you just don't get anywhere so uh, like I say pray for this uh, youth a program that we're going to start and I, if you're asked to volunteer if you're asked to help uh, please say yes you never know it might just be something you really like and that, you know the nice thing about looking at these things as experiments you can say yes and then you oh I didn't really like that you can say I don't want to do it anymore it's okay sometimes people are reluctant to say yes because they don't know they can get out of it if they don't like it around here you can so <laughs> so have a good week uh, invite somebody or somebodies and uh, we'll have a great time next week. Lord, thank you that you are so good to us that you have shaped us individually and that you have a mission for all of us. And we can all be about inviting people uh, to come to this place, to come into your kingdom. I would pray that we would all do that this coming week and in the coming months ahead. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.